Over the last 18 months, most people across the UK have seen their pension values fall. But for some, that fall has been worse than for others, with their pensions down 10, 20, or even 30%. What's worse is that those that are sitting with the biggest losses are those that are invested in lower risk investments, which were the default options selected by their pension providers. This has been hugely distressing, especially for those that are approaching retirement. So I'm going to discuss why this has happened and what you should be doing moving forwards. But James, I don't think this applies to me because my pension is doing just fine. Well, lucky you but this could happen to you in the future, which is why the lessons to be learned here are important for everyone. So let's get into it. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is James. I am a financial planner and this is a place where you can learn to make smarter financial decisions. Your pension will predominantly be invested in a combination of two asset classes, stocks and bonds. Over the last 18 months, the global stock market has been pretty volatile. After peaking at the end of 2021, it fell 15% and has bounced around ever since. This is normal. We expect this kind of volatility when it comes to stocks. But what is not expected was what has happened in the bond market. Over the last year, central banks have raised interest rates at a faster pace than at any point in recent history, which has caused the biggest crash in bond prices in the last 100 years. This is not normal. But before I explain why this has happened and what this means for bond returns in the future, there is another factor that we need to discuss that has resulted in this crash being much worse than it should have been. To understand it, we're going to need to zoom out. If you're in the UK, it's likely that your pension will be the main tool that you use to fund your retirement. And by the time you retire, it will probably be your largest financial asset. As a population, we contribute billions of pounds to pensions every month. But what's crazy is that most people don't have a clue where their money actually goes. Yes, it gets invested, but invested in what? 50 years ago, retirees did not need to worry about any of this. Back then, people typically worked for a single employer for most of their lives, and in return, their company would look after them in retirement by paying them a pension, which was typically a multiple of their final salary. Back then, the responsibility and risk of retirement sat with the employer, not the employee. But as it turned out, these defined benefit schemes were so generous that companies struggled to pay them. And nowadays, they are generally only available in the public sector. Over the last 20 years, DB schemes have been phased out and they've been replaced by defined contribution pensions, which many people prefer because it gives them more control and flexibility. With a DC pension, you control how much you save into it, how it's invested and how you take income from it in retirement and you can even pass it on to future generations. DC pensions have a lot of advantages, and now that employers are required to enroll their employees into a pension automatically, more people are saving towards their retirements than ever before. This is a very good thing. However, although DC pensions give you more power, just like in other DC universes, with great power comes great responsibility. With a defined benefit pension, a company guarantees to pay you an income throughout retirement. So it's their responsibility to make sure that they save enough money and they invest it in a way that is going to deliver that income. All of the risk and responsibility sits with your employer. But with a DC pension, that responsibility sits with us. We are now responsible for saving enough for our own retirements, for making sure that it's invested correctly and for drawing it down sustainably in retirement so that we don't run out of money. Which is pretty nuts when you consider the financial literacy of the average person in the UK. If you want to have the best chances of success in retirement, not only do you need to understand how pensions work, but you also need to understand how to pick investments that are appropriate for your own goals. How the hell is the average person supposed to do that? We've been given all this flexibility and control, but we don't have the knowledge or the skills to use it wisely. Although pension providers and the regulator know that. They know that most people don't bother learning about pensions until they're closer to retirement. And even then, they know that most people don't have the confidence to select their own investments. They know that 73% of people leave their pension invested in the default fund option, which would be fine, if the default option was actually any good. But the problem is that if we know that most people are just gonna stick with a default, how does a pension provider design a single fund that is going to be appropriate for everybody? We all have unique circumstances, different goals, different attitudes to risk. So all they can do is try and build something that works for the average person. 
This is why the default option for most major pension funds includes something called lifestyling, where it systematically changes the way that you're invested as you get closer to retirement. When you're 15 plus years away, you'll be invested in a higher risk fund with a higher exposure to the stock market. But as you get closer to retirement, you'll gradually be shifted into a lower risk fund with a higher exposure to bonds. This is based on the premise that for the average person, it makes sense for them to be reducing the risk of their pension as they get closer closer to retirement. But there are two problems here. The first is that although this may be right for the average person, very few people are actually average. We each have our own unique circumstances, which means that the default options are often not suitable for our specific needs. Perhaps you have a higher attitude to risk than the average person, or have other assets that you can draw on, meaning that there is no need for you to reduce the risk of your pension as you get closer to retirement. Or at the other end of the spectrum, perhaps this average risk path is too aggressive for you, and you may end up with a very painful investment journey. Either way, these default pension options will systematically move you into lower risk funds, which may not be appropriate for you. The second problem is that these lower risk funds tend to contain a lot more bonds because they are considered to be lower risk than stocks. But unfortunately, over the last 18 months, bonds have been witnessing stock-like crashes with some areas of the market seeing 30 or even 40% declines. So what does this look like in reality? We're now going to take a look at some default fund examples. But to be clear, I am not recommending these funds. These are just for illustrative purposes and they may not be suitable for you. Aviva is the second largest DC pension provider in the UK. And like most providers, they have tried to make their default funds slightly more customized by offering three options depending on what your goals are at retirement. If you plan on drawing down from your pension flexibly in retirement, there's a drawdown option. If you plan on taking your pension as a cash lump sum, there's a cash lump sum option. And if you plan on taking your tax-free cash and then buying an annuity with the rest of your pension, there's an annuity option. With a drawdown option, up until 15 years before retirement, you're invested in their growth fund, which is 85% invested in risk assets like stocks and property and 15% in bonds. And then you're gradually switched into their drawdown fund, which has 60% invested in risk assets and 40% in bonds. Over the last five years, the growth fund has returned 44%, which is not bad. But then again, if you are actually comfortable taking higher levels of risk, a globally diversified 100% equity portfolio would have returned over 50% in the period, meaning you would have left a significant chunk of returns on the table. But on the flip side, this fund has been pretty volatile. It fell by over 20% during the COVID crash, which would have been very concerning if you're not comfortable with that type of risk. The drawdown fund that you then get phased into has returned 27%. At one point, this fell 12% from its peak, which may seem like a small amount. But again, if you're a low risk investor right before retirement, that could be pretty tough. The cash lump sum strategy starts to phase you into a lower risk consolidation fund when you're 14 years from retirement. It contains 25% risk assets and 75% bonds. That has returned 9% over the last five years. And then in the four years before retirement, you're phased into a cash position. This strategy does what it says on the tin. It moves you to cash so that you can take your pension as a lump sum on retirement. If you went with the annuity option, at 14 years from retirement, you start to get phased into the same consolidation fund. And then four years from retirement, you get phased into the annuity fund, which is 100% bonds and is unfortunately down 20% and fell by almost 40% from its peak. Now, if you do genuinely plan on buying an annuity, this is not as big a problem as it may seem because as bond prices have fallen, the costs of buying an annuity have also fallen dramatically too. But what if you selected this option by mistake? 15 years ago, buying an annuity at retirement was the normal thing to do. So people may have selected this option in error and seen their pension value crushed in the final few years of retirement. These are the reasons why you should not blindly trust the default fund your pension is invested in. If you want the best chance of success in retirement, you need to take this into your own hands. You need to educate yourself and understand the options that are available to you and select a strategy that is appropriate for your needs. If that sounds like a daunting prospect, you should know that there are tens of thousands of people who watch my channel regularly, who have already gone on that journey and learn how to invest for themselves. 
And if you want to follow in their footsteps, I have left a list of videos down in the description to help you on your way. So from now on, you are not going to settle for the default. You are going to learn to make your own investment choices. But what should you do if you are already invested in a fund that is heavily exposed to bonds and has recently fallen in value? Should you sell it and invest in something else? Well, maybe not. Just because bonds have fallen recently, that does not mean that they will continue to do so in the future. In fact, when bond prices fall, their future expected returns increase. Let me explain. Let's say you bought a five-year bond at par value for £100, and that bond was due to pay out 1% in coupons each year. You know each year you're going to get £1 of income, and then you'll get your £100 back at maturity. With bonds, you know exactly what your return will be if you hold it to maturity and the issuer doesn't default. That is why bonds are called fixed income, and that's why they're also considered to be low risk. But what if you bought this bond and the prevailing interest rates immediately increased to 5%? What will happen to your return? Nothing. You're still going to get paid £1 every year and get your £100 back at the end. It's fixed income. The nominal return does not change. But if you try to sell that bond to me, well, I'm not going to pay you £100 for it. I want a yield of 5% because that's what I can now get elsewhere. So I would need to offer you £82.60 for it, which would mean that I get the £1 annual coupon payment, plus I get £100 back when the bond matures. This means that each year I can expect the bond's price to increase so that between the £1 coupon and the capital gain, I'd be earning a yield to maturity of 5% per year. If this was a 10-year bond, I would need to offer you even less for it to make up for the fact that I'm only going to be getting that £1 coupon for 10 years. So I need an even larger capital gain to make up for it. And if it was a 30-year bond, or even less. This is exactly what has been playing out in the bond market over the last 18 months. As interest rates have been rising fast, this has caused bond prices to crash, especially long-term bonds. It's been a once in a hundred year event, which does not seem likely to happen again in the near future. So what does this mean for the future of bond returns? Although their prices have fallen, their expected future returns have increased a lot, and you can now find well-diversified bond funds offering yield to maturities of 5 or 6% per year. Yes, interest rates may rise further than is already anticipated, and bond prices could fall. But equally, rates could fall, and you could end up with an even greater return than this. This is precisely why it is so dangerous to pick funds solely based on their past performance, because it's so tempting to simply sell the thing that went down recently and buy the thing that went up when the thing that went down often ends up with a higher expected return in the future. This is why you now need to watch this video here as I show you the three big mistakes that everyone makes when picking funds.